You know, tonight I thought I would give a long intro, but instead I think we should have a long talk. So <laughs> Matt is somebody who you'll learn a lot about. I learned about him when I moved to Berkeley. The parking day was his greatest hit, but as you'll see, like tonight, there's an opening over at the Stanford Cantor Center that has another Williams installation. So let's just hear from Matt. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Paul. He didn't mention he was my neighbor, did he? Maybe he did. That's why I'm here. Uh, thanks, to all, thanks to all of you for coming. This is my first time at Park, and it's very exciting to be here. Um, earlier this year, I had an opportunity to give a lecture in Medellin in Colombia at the World Bicycle Forum. And at that talk, I started a tradition that I'd like to continue tonight, and that is of taking a selfie with my audience. So if you will indulge me, I'm just going to step over here. And on the count of three, let's see, Xerox, right? That's a good word. OK, you guys ready? One, two, three. Xerox. Xerox. Yeah. It's not? It's a Xerox company, is it not? OK. Well, we can debate that after I tell you about some of my artwork. <laughs> um, so I'm a professional artist, and most of my work looks at cities. Uh, I'm a founder, I'm the founder of More Lab, which is an art and design studio based in Oakland, California. And More Lab is an offshoot of Rebar, which is a fairly well-known organization that I started about 10 years ago. There were three partners at Rebar. The other two guys joined up with Gell Architects, which is a, a Danish architecture firm, very, very prominent firm. Uh, and I spun off to continue doing art projects uh, and to con continue some of the conceptual threads that I developed uh, at Rebar. So Rebar became quite well known for this project, which is called Parking. It's a temporary public park in a metered parking space. And this eventually became a worldwide movement called Parking Day, which I'll tell you all about in just a second. But More Lab focuses on art projects and exhibitions and spatial designs that explore the social and political dynamics of public space. At a fundamental level, uh, my work engages the interaction between the human imagination and the physical landscape. I'm interested in how people organize and divide the landscape and how we apply laws and regulations and systems of valuation and historical narratives and mythology and so forth, especially in the urban context. How we use all of those kinds of systems to organize and divide and understand uh, our, our uh, environment. So in a way, it's not unlike UX UI design, right? This is a, a human looking at a system, a human interacting with the system. In this case, that system or systems is the city. So my career started way outside the city, actually, in a desolate tract of New Mexico desert down where that red circle is. Uh, it's an anonymous little plot of desert outside of Deming, New Mexico, in the southwest corner of the state. And <clears throat> this art and design magazine out of Brooklyn, New York, called Cabinet, uh, for its issue on the theme of property, uh, bought a half acre of this land on eBay, sight unseen, for $300. And they were offering magazine-sized plots to their readers for comparatively uh, generous terms. For a penny, you could get a 99-year lease on basically enough land to stand on. Uh, and so this half acre plot here, is about 20 miles east of the town of Dimming, which has a couple thousand people. And it's between Interstate 10 to the south and the Southern Pacific Railway to the north. And it's part of a failed residential development that was called the Sunshine Valley Ranchettes. Uh, it failed in the early 60s due to lack of water rights, but not before these plat lines you see on the desert were inscribed and the, the space was starting to be defined uh, by these land developers. And so in contrast to the traditional system by which van, land is developed and exploited for its commercial value, as on the left here, this is an actual uh, advertisement for the Sunshine Valley Ranchettes, Cabinet was setting up their own system of valuation, uh, looking at this land for its experimental or its creative value. And they dubbed it Cabinetlandia. And they divided it up into these sections you see here. And at one point, they said, well, we're going to set aside a few pro sites for projects that we're going to commission artists to do projects on this site. And I thought, well, what better way to establish a culture than by creating a repository for its organizing documents? And thus was born the Cabinet National Library. 
So I offered to build them this library uh, made out of an ordinary office file cabinet that seems to sort of naturally emerge out of the desert. And we'd give it this grand name, the Cabinet National Library. So this is my elaborate set of construction documents that I sent to the magazine to convince them that I was legitimate. And they bought it. <laughs> um, and so in the summer of 2004, some friends of mine and I went out to the desert uh, to build the library. And this is how we found it. And so when you look at this land, notice that it's totally decoupled from the various forms of human imagination that we use to organize land, right? There's nothing inherent in the landscape that provides a clue for how human, humans would engage with it. Could be a private housing development, part of a national park, BLM land, a native reservation, a mining claim, or Cabinetlandia. Um, but so the codes and operations that are operational on the land here are invisible, com particularly compared with the, heavy, uh, the heavy, heavily coded landscapes of, of cities, which we'll look at in just a moment. And so the Cabinet National Library, here it is in all its glory, is a, your average uh, file cabinet embedded in an earthen wall, which is made of sandbags filled with local soil. And we covered the face with chicken wire and a local mud adobe mixture. Uh, and so in addition to looking like this radically dislocated file cabinet in the middle of a desolate desert um, that per per perhaps you know, emerged fully formed out of the desert, um, it was important that the library actually function down to the most minute detail. So the top drawer has the card catalog and a guest book to sign when you, when you visit. The middle drawer houses the collection, which are all of the back issues of Cabinet Magazine. And the bottom drawer has a snack bar that has water, beer, nuts, and a pair of work boots if you want to stay and do repairs. Uh, the magazine actually installed the, um, the mailbox you see there and tried desperately to get the local uh, postmaster to deliver mail out to Cabinetlandia, but so far they've been totally unsuccessful after 11 years of effort. <laughs> so that's where I started, out in the middle of nowhere in New Mexico. And the people with which I did that project, eventually we organized ourselves and became an art collective called Rebar that then developed into an art and design studio called Rebar. Um, but now I mostly work in cities, right? And as an artist, when I think about cities, and particularly the public spaces in cities, I'm interested in, in examining all of the different aspects of the city, from how it's produced through how it's used. So in thinking about how public space is produced and how it might eventually evolve into a place, there's several sort of modes of production to consider here. There's the physical production of space, right? Materials, form, physical aspects of spatial production. Social production of public space, which has sort of two meanings. There's the social process that produces space in the first place. And then there's sort of the outcome, the, the medium if you think of a city or public space, it's actually a medium in which social interactions can occur. And it's the medium for political protest, cultural expression, and demands for structural change. And I would say actually that public space is required for the production of democracy as well. Uh, d uh, democracy does not occur unless you have the space in which to enact it. Then there's the legal and sort of regulatory production that sometimes produces ridiculous results. This is an actual parking sign in Culver City, California, down in Los Angeles. I studied the philosophy of language undergrad, and I have a law degree also, and I cannot interpret that for you. I've tried. <laughs> I think it's got some internal contradictions. And of course, there's the aesthetic production of space, innovating in the streetscape with an eye towards aesthetics and the per persuasive power of good design. And so all of these forms of production can be sort of summarized under the banner of what this French theorist Henry Lefebvre called the right to the city in his seminal work from 1968 of the same name. For, Le for Lefebvre, the right to the city is the demand for a transformed and renewed access to urban life. Forty years later, the American geographer David Harvey updated and expanded this idea in a very famous essay called The Right to the City, which if you guys are interested in this topic, I highly, highly recommend to you. He teaches at NYU or Columbia, I think. In any case, I'll read aloud while you can read along silently. <laughs> 
The right to the city is far more than the individual liberty to access urban resources. It's a right to change ourselves by changing the city. It is moreover a common rather than an individual right, since this transformation inevitably depends upon the exercise of a collective power to reshape the process of urbanization. The freedom to make and remake our cities and ourselves is, I want to argue, one of the most precious yet most neglected of our human rights. And so to me, it's a very interesting time to think about urban, uh, urban space and urban public space in particular. As everyone in this room is well aware, uh, the role of public space is evolving very rapidly as technology begins to mediate many of the traditional functions of uh, urban public space. So we can trace the role of public space in, da in daily life back to the Greek idea of the agora, which means the gathering place. The Greek agora was the center of public life in the Greek city-state, a large public space, a marketplace, a community space, and a political gathering place. Now, many of those traditional functions of public space are now mediated through websites, through social media, through mobile devices. And so it brings up the question, in sort of a contemporary context, what is urban public space for? What is its role in contemporary urban life? Now we value, of course, face-to-face -face interactions and you can look at the popularity and the rise of farmers markets and buy local movements. And of course, we all have our favorite cafe. But the question remains, what is this relationship between technology and public space? And so when I think about this, I think sort of about the relationship between photography and painting. Uh, of course, they share a very complicated history. One sort of influenced the other and shaping the other. But there is a sort of uh, a thesis, a through line that runs through this relationship. Um, and with the invention of phot photographic technology, painting was free to develop past figurative work. Right? So here's a painting in 1860. 1861, we get photography. 1890, suddenly we have new ways of seeing, new manners of representation new visual theories. This is uh, Michel Duchamp's new descending a staircase, sort of the theory of flickering, the theory of motion, written in two dimensions. And then of course surrealism, abstract expressionism. And I would argue that current technology is having a similar effect on public space. Urban public space as a medium has been decoupled from these traditional sort of Greek values and its traditional role in civic life. And so perhaps it's maybe free to roam a little bit more towards surrealistic or abstract forms. And so if that's the case, how do we reimagine our city? What do we want our cities to be? There's many uh, contemporary art and design festivals that explore this question around the world uh, using small scale urban interventions to discover the full range of possibility for what cities could be, including a playground for experimentation and informal social gatherings, a crucible for possibility. But remember, cities evolve slowly. The city we ha inhabit today is actually a relic of the past. The cities in physical forms is an expression of past generations' priorities and values. Now, that's a wonderful aspect of a historical city, right? It's inhabitable history that enri enriches our daily life. And that's not exactly what I mean. But what I mean is, for example, um, let's look at San Francisco. Uh, in 1959, um, the planners decided in their wisdom to build the Embarcadero Freeway that essentially cut off the waterfront from the rest of the city. Now, here they're prioritizing the efficient movement of cars above all other priorities, right? This would never be built today based on sort of contemporary urban theory, urban planning values. Um, if you propose something like this, you'd be laughed out of the room and probably out of a job. And I don't know how many of you saw this when it was up, um, but there were actually plans to continue to expand it all across the city um, before it was damaged in 1989 in the Loma Prieta quake uh, and eventually demolished. Sometimes Mother Nature helps us renovate our cities when uh, maybe we're not following established, she's not following established planning processes. Um, but as you guys have probably seen, 
This is the Embarcadero today. It's a tree-lined boulevard with bike lanes and wide sidewalks and many forms of cultural attractions. Um, and so now there's this movement to intentionally deconstruct freeway, freeways all around the country to reprioritize more sustainable uh, values and to reflect our com contemporary ideas about what a city could be. So this is a shot of Boston and the big dig that was started in 1982 and took 25 years to complete, finished in 2007. And now it's the Rose Kennedy Greenway, this mile and a half strip of park through downtown Boston. Uh, the same thing's happening in Seattle with the Alaska Viaduct. Um, like the Big Dig, this is a tunnel. And uh, this is the drill bit. I don't know if anyone has been following uh, this dig, but that's the drill bit, and it got stuck. And so now they're drilling a hole down to the bit to figure out why it got stuck <laughs> and what the problem is. <laughs> um, so we've been, we've been spending billions of dollars, much, many resources, and decades to undo these outdated ideas of the past. And this is right and necessary to do. Um, but it's important to remember this essential thing. The physical revision of the city is much slower than the rate of our cultural evolution. Let me say that again. The physical revisions of the city are much slower than the rate of cultural evolution. And driven by technology, the rate of cultural evolution is only rapidly, only increasing, right? So then how do we update our cities to reflect contemporary values and our contemporary selves? How do we create cities that can adapt quickly to these ever-changing needs of its communities? How do we encourage participation in the craft of city making to move toward a more dynamic and resilient and decentralized city? Those are big questions. <laughs> but Rebar and, and now More Lab often use physical materials of the city uh, to explore some of these questions, such as easy, easily recognizable iconic elements like parking meter heads, or pedestrian traffic signals that can be repositioned to explore their symbolic meaning, and sculptures that use uh, familiar materials to create seemingly impossible results. This is a sculpture uh, made out of railroad track that was recently installed uh, at a new rail station in Portland, Oregon. And it's made from track that we extracted from the ground less than a quarter of a mile from the sculpture site. He's actually the designer, my son Ben. Here's the piece finished. The geometry is sort of informed by the abstract topological uh, transit maps. Um, if anyone from Portland asks, I'll deny this, but it's actually based on the BART map and not the map of Portland. <laughs> I think I signed a release, so that might be getting out publicly. Oh, well. Yes. <laughs> anyway. Um, I also work in tiny urban niches that can be developed into public amenities, uh, such as this ribbon park in the south part of San Francisco. Um, there's a cafe down at the end, and then this series of tables and benches that sort of hug along uh, this building this little sliver of San Francisco. But as I mentioned at the beginning, the project I'm best known for, uh, and the one that really engages all aspects of the city, the physical, cultural, social, political, legal um, aspects of the city is Parking Day. And Parking Day began as parking, which was an extremely temporary intervention in a metered parking space in downtown San Francisco. And on a sunny day in November of 2005, we unrolled some living sod, a tree, and a bench in a parking spot for two hours. That was the length of the lease offered on the face of the meter. So we only stayed for you know, as long as we were allowed, after which we packed up and left. And we created a temporary public park and opened it. And here you can see a man, he's having a slice of pizza. You guys reading the paper. And so this is in an area that the Department of City Planning of San Francisco had identified as lacking green space. These sort of irregular gray figures uh, are, are these sites that the city had, or these areas the city had identified uh, in 2005 as lacking green space. Now, in terms of like the rate of our city's re uh, renovation, the physical renovation, uh, there is a park now planned uh, for inside this zone. It's a new roof park at the new Transbay Terminal that's going to open, hopefully, in 2017. So that's 12 years, 12 years from identifying this issue, 
creating this map to actually creating a solution. We did it much quicker. <laughs> um, so we distributed images of the piece, particularly this one, uh, uh, to around the world. It hit some blogs and became this sort of viral, this sort of meme um, event in 2005. And people started approaching us, asking us to replicate the project in their city. Um, but the truth of the matter was it took about $200 and a few emails and a couple of beers. Um, so we started telling people to do it themselves. Um, we created a how-to manual and consciously made a decision to let this project become an open source project. Anyone is free to adapt the idea, to remix it, to use it to explore unmet social needs in their particular city or community. Uh, and there's only two conditions. One is just give us credit for the idea. And two is not to use the project for any commercial purpose. It really has to be this sort of act of civic generosity to your neighborhood. And so in 2006, to sort of gather this interest, uh, we renamed the Project Parking Day and established an annual global event. Uh, it's coming up, actually, next week. It's the third Friday in September. So if you see people doing weird things in parking spaces, you, can, you have me to blame. <laughs> Um, and so we now organize the project through this social network, which leverages all of the expertise of the participants. And parks have appeared all over the world. Los Angeles, this is in Sicily. There's Glasgow, Scotland. Manchester, UK. Seoul, South Korea. One of my personal favorites, this is in Tehran in 2011. And in addition to this geographic diversity, the project also became conceptually diverse as individuals started to use Parking Day to advance various political and social agendas. Uh, in this case, this is a project in front of City Hall, and there's a, a wheelbarrow for each city supervisor of San Francisco with a dahlia in it. The dahlia is the city flower of the city. And uh, residents of each of the supervisor districts were invited to come and leave messages for their supervisor about how they felt about the amount of public space in their district or in the city more generally. And at the end of the day, the producers of this took the flowers and all the notes and bundled it up and delivered them to each of the supervisors. So people used it to make new sort of forms of culture or to comment on the environment or food production to propose new forms of ecology. And uh, as a venue for social activism, here is a free public health clinic uh, along Cesar Chavez Avenue in San Francisco where a lot of day laborers operate. Uh, and they could come here and get informal medical advice. In 2007, um, you know, we began looking for new ways that we could experience Parking Day. We were sort of tethered to our own spot and after the event would hear tales of all this great stuff that was happening around San Francisco, and we had missed it all, and we'd only see the photos and be sort of bummed. So in 2007, we decided to take our park on the road, and we invented the world's first pedal-powered public park. It's called the Park Cycle. It's built on an old boat trailer, and it's designed to synchronize with the auto, uh, automobile infrastructure, right, to deliver public space where and when it's needed. We've got a custom-built drivetrain, motorcycle forks, custom pedals, a water-retaining landscape material. We put, covered it with living sod and a tree, and pedaled it around San Francisco on parking day and actually got stuck in traffic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and we were pulled over by the police on only one occasion. but we were providing much needed park space all over uh, the city. And we finally set our sights on City Hall and parked in Mayor Gavin Newsom's personal parking space in front of City Hall. He came out there and actually we tried to get him to come in and pedal with us, but he was in a, that nice suit so he wouldn't do it. So Parking Day gives people around the world a forum to express their desires about a more sustainable city. More green space, more places for people, less parking spaces, more transit options, and a broad, open, and creative conception of contemporary public space. It's a participatory art project and a global statement about creatively reimagining the urban commons. 
Um, I get asked a lot about numbers, and the last year we tried to measure how many participants were in Parking Day was 2011. And as you can see, it really was worldwide, almost 1,000 installations in 160 cities, 35 countries on all of the permanently inhabited continents except this one. It's maybe next year. <laughs> but Parking Day is prototyping, right? It's training, it's brainstorming, it's sketching, and it's asking questions. What else could you do with this space? What else could you do with your city? And for some people, it's about advocacy. For others, it's more just about play. But these are not permanent solutions to any problem, right? They're a statement, they're a laboratory, they're a conversation starter. So then the question is, okay, the conversation started, what do we do next? Well, the interest in Parking Day, along with the global economic collapse in 2008, in 2008 um, gutted a lot of the funding for public realm projects, and so this created a very interesting moment for cities. And uh, with good ideas, but not very much money, cities like New York and San Francisco began to uh, experiment with what the Project for Public Spaces has called light, quick, and cheap public spaces. So bureaucrats in New York began to remake large swaths of the paved commons into human spaces using just paint and movable chairs. And Broadway Street, as I'm sure you all know, is now pedestrianized. It's closed to, to auto traffic. Uh, we did one of these in downtown Oakland in this uh, highly visible but problematic intersection where Telegraph Avenue meets Broadway. And we're using a combination of built-in planters and signage and movable seating and modules, we could test a variety of spatial arrangements, uh, spatial arrangements and programs that would ultimately inform the design of a permanent plaza that is now actually under construction. And during the pilot period, this project was a, a platform for culture and hosted a, an array of uh, free events, like this uh, free lending library. And the pilot concluded in last year in 2014, and as I say, the, the permanent plaza is now currently uh, under construction. In San Francisco, this program to change excess roadways into public plazas is called Pavement to Parks. And a subset of Pavement to Parks is the Parklet program, which was developed by a planner named Andres Power uh, in direct response and with direct inspiration uh, from Parking Day. And so to create these parklets, you guys have probably seen these. Um, they're all over now. The city creates a permit structure, and a merchant or individual organization uh, can fund the project and agrees to steward and maintain the space. And local designers have this very sort of uh, you know, understandable scale in which they can test out some new ideas. These installations are what's called ongoingly temporary. They're renewed every year, but because they're built on the surface of the street, they can be reversed. So now there's similar projects popping up all over the U.S., including Portland and New York and L.A., all of them testing the effects of giving car space back to people on a temporary and trial basis. And at Rebar, we worked uh, with the Department of City Planning to develop the pilot program for parklets and uh, built a few of our own using this sort of modular approach to public space making. Um, here you've got sort of a flexible kit of parts that you can use to build a parklet. Again, thinking of the city as this laboratory to test out different arrangements, different user programs and combinations. And each of these can be sort of reshuffled, right? Each of these little three-foot-wide modules, once on the ground, can be reshuffled to test out a variety of ideas. Uh, there's a couple dozen parklets now in San Francisco. Some of them are artworks. Um, now, one sort of inevitability when you take what began as a guerrilla art project and turn it into an official uh, city program is uh, something like this, which is the Powell Street Promenade. It's a two block long mega parklet uh, developed by this renowned landscape architect, Walter Hood, who uh, is the chair of the department at UC Berkeley of landscape architecture. But what makes the Powell Street Promenade different from any other parklet is it was funded by Audi, a luxury car company. And it reportedly cost about $900,000 which is not much cheaper than building real city. 
Um, and so it features these very interesting design moves that are actually inspired um, by the Audi A7 luxury sedan, right? Not necessarily by the needs of the adjacent businesses or the communities, but very sexy, zoomy design by a very skilled designer, um, but inspired by this luxury automobile. So when something, as I say, goes from being this guerrilla art project to an official city program, these are the kinds of sort of logical cul-de-sacs you can find yourself involved with. Um, so interestingly, like in the same way with Parking Day, we created this manual that people could use uh, to, to um, adapt the project themselves. The San Francisco Department of City Planning has itself made a parklet manual. And now these programs are popping up all over the world. And this is sort of where the story gets sort of fractal and starts to fold back on itself a little bit. Um, now the city, uh, this is in San Francisco in particular, uh, is actively approaching the design and art community for ideas on how we could improve the city. This was a festival that took place in 2012. And we saw some prototypes for new urban instruments. This is a do-it-yourself traffic counter and a glowing crosswalk. You can put anywhere you think a crosswalk is needed. This project, The Pulse of the City, measured the heart rates of citizens and gave them sort of momentary insight into their physiological condition. Some of these projects were more playful. This is the clip inside that uh, allows you to clip these little modules onto a staircase and turn it into a slide. Um, and now urban prototyping festivals are being packaged up for cities around the country. Uh, and there was recently one on Market Street, some of you may have seen earlier this year, um, the Market Street Prototyping Festival, which is looking at how artists and designers might start to engage some of the really intractable social problems uh, that, that occur all along Market Street. So anyway, to me, the, the, the civic agencies and the artist and the general public each have an important role to play in co-creating the city. For artists and museums and institutions, I would say the city is a medium, and we should make and curate and promote and produce work with a sense of civic pride, inclusion, responsibility, and joy. To civic agencies, the city is a collaboration. Not, a central, not all pro central problems have central solutions, and the best solutions may be bottom-up, and flexible, distributed, and adaptive, as opposed to top-down. And to urban inhabitants, and including you, UX designers, the city is yours. Practice your right to the city. It's more than something that you passively receive. You're a key collaborator in its making, and you are an expert at using it. Participate in the process. Make yourself heard, because working together, artists and agencies and everyday people, each playing their part, can elevate our cities into truly magnificent works of art. And whether you know it or not, this city belongs to us. Thanks. No questions. I'm curious about um, what materials you provided people for the prototyping activity or whoever um, organized it on Market Street. Yeah, it was organized by YBCA, the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts, and people could submit their ideas online, and then there was a curatorial committee, which I was part of, that selected a couple dozen uh, for implementation, and each of those designers got $2,000. Uh, and then they also got matched up with a local, what they were calling uh, zone captains, um, which were local organizations that could help with um, capacity and execution. Autodesk was one of them. The Exploratorium was one of them. Um, so these are places that would donate materials, donate their technology, donate their expertise to really sort of stretch out how far that $2,000 could go. Um, and then some of those projects, um, you know, the city looked at and is thinking of evolving those into new permit programs in the same way that, that Parking Day became Parklets. Um, and so the Department of City Planning is really funny. When that project came out, they said, this is not an art festival. This is an act of governance. 
thought that was really interesting. They were, this is a way that the city planners are governing now, you know? Yeah. Question, okay, uh, voice of a contrarian here. I'm, yeah. Uh, I mean, I love what you're doing, love all this, and I'm seeing this, if I'm looking for a parking place in the city, Yeah. and I wonder, what are those guys doing? So annoying, you're right. Yeah. yeah. So how do you, uh, what's, your, what's your story on that? How do you respond <laughs> to those people that say, what are they doing taking away all of our, these parking places? Yeah, yeah, well, there's a number of, of ways to respond to that. One is that there's almost 30,000 on-street parking spaces in San Francisco, and we're taking a couple dozen at most for a few hours. The other is, is that on-street parking is highly subsidized by the public. That's not market rate for parking. If you look at what a private garage charges before what, uh, next to what you pay for a parking meter, there's this perverse incentive to drive around looking for cheap on-street parking. And there's an urban planner who just retired at UCLA named Donald Shoup, who studied this, what he calls trolling, in Westwood, California, which is like 10 square blocks around UCLA. And his students calculated that your average person looking for on-street parking drove about a quarter mile extra looking for the meter. And over time, that's almost a million miles driven uh, every year in excess, just looking for that cheap subsidized parking. And so we can't keep doing that. We can't, that's not a sustainable model. That's not a sustainable way to use our public space, to give so much of it over to this subsidized storage of automobiles. We just can't keep doing it. So something has to change. And there's big, vast, you know, top-down solutions to that issue. And then there's also sort of more flexible, temporary, experimental bottom-up solutions as well. And that's sort of where I would, I would put this. But I would be annoyed too. I drive a car too, and it's it's definitely annoying. <laughs> there's there's no way around it. Hi, yeah. So I was um, driving up to the city the other day for meetings, whatever, and I did something I felt sort of guilty about, um, which was that I used this app called Lux for the first time. Huh. Um, and the way Lux works is you show up, and then some dude in a blue um, uh, coat uh, takes your car and parks it somewhere or other, um, and wow. uh, and then brings it back to you. And on one, and I sort of felt a certain degree of you know liberal guilt about this whole process, yeah. right? And you know, it, it seemed counter to. I mean, dude, like valet parking, maybe it's okay in L.A. I don't know. In in, in San Francisco, it made me feel guilty. Wow. But then I'm like, well, it's actually cheaper. You know, including like over tipping my my my, my valets kind of thing, <laughs> it was still cheaper than parking at the at the garage wow. down well, the street. Did you know what he was doing with your car? Well, I mean, one of the things is I have a 2003 Prius with uh -huh. three car seats in the back, so it's not uh -huh. exactly like he was going to yeah. drag race it, right? Right, right. Um, but it, and in fact, I note that it got parked because you know you, there's sort of like an icon on a map. Right, it, it got sure parked you know. at like a little parking lot around the back of my building, right? Uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, which I don't have access to because I don't have the monthly, huh. you know, thing. I just wanted to ask about that because it was for me there was this interesting, you know, it ties into this discussion about the gentrification of the city. Sure. Um, and yet. The, you know, we're seeing this, 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 the, the, the parking space as this sort of, you know, object of, of contention. Can you talk a little bit about some of those tensions and maybe make me feel less guilty or more guilty? I don't know if I can make you feel less guilty. Uh, I, I feel clarify like my guilt, yes. Apps, apps are starting, we're being momified. It's the momification of our lives. We've got like, an, instead of our mom doing things for us when we're an adolescent or a teenager, now we have these apps that'll do our laundry and park our car. And, did your mom used to park your car? Because we, we could talk <laughs> she used to about drive, this. She used to drive me. You know. um, yeah, I mean, I think there's ways in which technology can be deployed to, to create incredible efficiencies, right, around these issues. One of those was this, this program in San Francisco called SF Park that would show you where there were free parking spaces, right, and so you could drive and, and find them. It was actually a government uh, pro project. Um, and there are certainly ways in which Uber and, and other, you know, Lyft and those kinds of things create efficiencies and create sort of less, you know, um, less inefficient use of these materials that we already own, these objects and these vehicles that we already own. Um, but I don't know, I, you know, I don't know if I can make you feel that much better. Um, it really depends on, 
a number of factors like how far he had to drive and, and that sort of stuff and what sort of access he's got, what sort of knowledge do they have about where these spaces are, you know, sort of wondering about that brokering and if he's got some sort of inside track to sort of park right behind your building efficiently, then that's great. That would save you from trolling in this Donald Shoopian way, right? So that's nice, um, but at the same time, it's also sort of out of sight, out of mind, and are you sort of alleviating yourself, you know, of this issue? And it's nice to hear that you're sensitive enough to, to have this tension within you, um, but there's a way in which you, you could also just be sort of outsourcing that whole issue, right? Here, Mr. Guy in a blue coat, here's my keys now, now what's your problem? I don't know. I don't know if I adequately answered your question or just sort of tacked on a few more questions to it. <laughs> Gesturing. Okay. So I love I love how humble um, the beginnings are and how you've got traction across the world. Um, it makes me sad, in contrast to something like the um, Bay Bridge lights installation. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wonder if you could comment on that because it seems as if um, there's such a big middle ground that we're missing as well. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I do make a part of my living doing public art somewhere in that middle ground. Um, but the Bay Lights, you know, that was a privately funded project um, from top to bottom. Um, and I think, you know, in this country in particular, there's, there's a real lack of opportunities for artists. There's a lack of public funding. Um, and what that tends to do is create an extraordinary amount of competition between artists who are all going after the same commissions. Um, you know, and, and I go after commissions all the time with colleagues and friends and people that I've done this, you know, with dozens of times. And it's just too bad that, like, that's the sort of structure in which we live. Um, public funding for art seems to be cut first, you know. Um, certainly by more conservative politicians, um, who I suppose just fail to see the value. And it's frustrating because there's, there's demonstrable and measurable economic value to public art, right? You can, there's studies that have been done that show how these, it doesn't have to be as grand as the Bay Lights or as sort of small scale as this, but uh, contribute to the quality of, of public space and therefore contribute to the economics of a city as well. Um, so even if we want to have a sort of very, um, you know, sort of uh, cold financial analysis of the value of public art, it still sort of stands up under that kind of analysis. I'm not sure I answered your question either, but. <laughs> no, I certainly heard you. Yeah. I mean, obviously America's worse than Europe in that regard. Yeah, I, I did a project in um, Amsterdam a few years ago. And it was with this, this design group over there, and I said, you know, where do you guys get your money? And they say, oh, we're, we're registered. I'm like, what does that mean? Like, well, we registered with the government, and so they pay us like two or 300,000 euros a year to exist. Like, we're a cultural organization. It's just amazing. It's just astounding that that kind of thing exists, you know. And it improves the literacy of the population, too. What's that? It improves the literacy of people because they yeah. see more. Yeah. And they have more built Definitely. in. Anyway, Definitely. yeah, I mean, there's no solution, obviously, but both are needed, I suppose. Mm. I think we've exhausted the questions for this evening. I appreciate your coming to share all your ideas sure. with us, Matt. Thanks. And, and let's give him a warm uh, thank you. Thanks. Thank you.